Okay, uh, we've been talking about uh, solutions last time. Um, once again, solutions are our aqueous skies uh, made up of two things, our solute and our solvent. The solute being the smaller part of the solution, the solvent being the larger part of the solution. Uh, we talked about sort of the idea of uh, like dissolves like. And that's really the idea that really the way that uh, sort of molecules can interact well with each other is if they're interacting the same way that they interact with themselves uh, using those intermolecular forces. Uh, so things that are, as we talked about, ionic and polar work really well together. Uh, things that are polar and polar work well together. Uh, nonpolar and nonpolar also work very well together as they are typically going to be soluble. Uh, but when we do cross over from polar to nonpolar, we do run into some trouble again because they're really using very different types of uh, forces. Uh, Nonpolar things, for example, is usually will be using dispersion forces, which are really weak temporary sort of interactions. Uh, polar things will either be using hydrogen bonding or dipole dipole. So over a long period of time, they have no way to maintain that interaction. Uh, so they really can't sort of mix very well. Uh, we talked about sort of concentration units. So we had our percent uh, mass to mass, uh, which is our mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution times 100 uh, percent we also had uh, percent uh, volume to volume which is the volume of solutes over the volume of solution times 100 percent and we had percent mass to volume uh, which is our mass of our solute over volume of solution times 100%. So these sort of percent concentrations, as we talked about, if you are given the percentage, uh, you could kind of convert it into a usable conversion factor by assuming 100. Uh, so if you had a 2% by mass sodium chloride solution, that means you would have two grams of sodium chloride and 100 grams of solution. Uh, out of these three, as we mentioned, uh, you do want to be careful on the bottom part of this guy as it is usually sort of given separate to you, the solute and the solvent sort of uh, information. So you want to make sure you're not just using the solvent, uh, that you add those together to get the mass of the solution. We finished up talking about really the uh, most common unit of concentration, which is molarity, which is our big M, and that is moles per liter. Uh, you can again think of it as a formula where we could solve for liters by taking moles divided by molarity. Or if we want moles, which is a very common calculation, it is liters times molarity. That's a really important thing as well when you are using, again, molarity by itself. Uh, the volume does need to be in liters for it to properly cancel out. Uh, if you multiply by milliliters, you will not get moles. Uh, you'll get, again, millimoles. So you'll be off by a factor of a thousand, probably in the calculation that you're doing. So you always want to make sure that they're in liters when you do that. Also, we talked about the idea that if you do have the molarity given to you and you want to use it in a calculation, it's probably best to get rid of the big M and convert it into both units so you can see it, like 2.55 moles per liter of sodium chloride. And once again, that will allow you to see both of those units uh, and you can kind of treat it like a conversion factor, dimensional analysis. Um, very common, as I mentioned, that people leave the big M, they really sort of lose track of the volume part of it or where it is and what they should be doing in terms of multiplying and dividing, or if it's there at all, they're not even sure where it is a lot of times. So it's really good to get rid of the big M, kind of convert it to both units so you can see both units, you can see where they are, and you can do your calculations sort of accordingly. Any questions on any of that stuff there? <clears throat> All right, so I think we uh, laid up on this example. I don't think we did it. So why don't we do it here? Uh, calculate the molarity of 15.6 grams of KBr. 
in enough water to make 1.25 liters uh, potassium, 3910, and, and our bromine, uh, 70. Uh, so obviously here we are looking for uh, the molarity, uh, which is our moles per liter. Uh, in this case, uh, we do have the mass of our solute, which is our KBR. Uh, in this case, we actually do have the volume given to us of 1.25 liters, and it's in the correct unit. So that is really the bottom part there of what we need. Uh, so we just need to get some moles. So really at this point, it's a grams to mole situation, which is why we have our periodic table information up there. Uh, we could calculate the molar mass here by basically just adding those together. And that's going to give us 119 grams per mole. So we'll take our grams to convert them into moles here. Again, we want grams on the bottom so that they cancel. And that's going to be 0 0.131 moles. Uh, once again, that is basically the top part there of what we need. So now we have everything that we need to calculate the molarity. Uh, we'll take our moles. Uh, we'll take our volume, which is already in liters, and we'll divide it out there. And it looks like we will end up with 0 0.105. Now, the units do not cancel, so the number stays with the moles, and it is per liter here of KBR. Or at this point, you can then, if you want, bring back the big M and just write big M KBR as well. Any questions on that calculation? So that's a very common conversion that you need to do, which is using the molar mass to go from grams to moles when you're calculating molarity. Also, another very common conversion, although we were good in this case, is our milliliters to liter conversion is used a lot when we're using solutions because oftentimes we will measure things in milliliters and obviously to convert it to liters to calculate the molarity or use it with molarity. Any questions on any of that there? All right, let's take a look then at another one here. What is the mass in grams of sodium nitrate that you need to make 2.5 liter of a 0.15 molar solution of sodium nitrate? Uh, sodium is uh, 2299. Nitrogen is 1401. Okay, so once again here, uh, we're dealing with molarity, which is our moles per liter. Uh, in this case, we obviously have the volume of 2.5 liters. Uh, we have the molarity of 0 0.150 molar. Uh, so if you weren't sure, uh, we do have the molarity given to us. Really, we have the volume. So moles would seem like a good place to go to uh, to solve as that's the only thing we're not given. And that makes sense because then from there, we could use the molar mass to get to grams. So that's sort of a logical sort of pathway there. Uh, in this case, uh, we rearrange it. Uh, moles here will be liters times molarity. Once again, our units of volume is in liters, so that's good. If it's not, then you do need to convert it to liters when you're using molarity. Once again, I would get rid of the big M here and really use this as 0.15 moles per liter. So you can see both of the units and you could, if you wanted to flip it around and use it in this fashion. And once again, the number always stays with the moles part. It's always one liter. Uh, so if you take more of a dimensional analysis sort of approach here, 2.5 liters of our sodium nitrate. Once again, we want liters to cancel. So we're going to multiply it by the molarity. 0 0.15 moles per liter. Liters will cancel, and that will get us uh, 2.5 times 0 0.150, 0 0.375 moles of sodium nitrate. At this point, we need to go from our moles to grams, and that, again, is our molar mass from our periodic table here to do that. So we'll add up our parts. Uh, we got 2299 for our sodium plus a 1401 for our nitrogen plus three times 16 there for our oxygens. 
And that's going to give us 85 grams per mole as our molar mass. So we'll use that here coming into our final part of our calculation. Once again, opposites cancel. So in this case, we do want moles on the bottom. And we do want the grams up on top. The moles in this case will then cancel and we will be left with like 31.9 grams of sodium nitrate, three sig figs all around pretty much in this calculation. So three sig figs there on the answer. Uh, what that number basically means is if you're going to make the solution, you would weigh out 31.9 grams of the sodium nitrate, dissolve it in enough water to have a total volume of 2.5 liters, and at that point, you would then have a solution that has a molarity of 0.15 molar. Any questions on any of that? Yeah. Uh, I, I missed the first part of the question. The, where, is, where we're talking about the uh, 0.15 moles over L? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, so it's one liter, yeah. Yeah, so molarity, that's pretty much the definition of it. It's basically how many moles there is in one liter. So whenever you kind of convert and get rid of the big M, uh, the number should always stay with the moles part, and it's always like one liter, basically, yeah. Other questions? It's kind of like molar mass when we do the grams per mole, so that's how many grams there are in one mole, basically, of all that. So it kind of works the same way. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. All right, so let's... Continue on here, take a look at a few more things. All right, so I think also last time we talked about the idea of how concentration relates to the individual ions. So for each of these solutions separately, for each of these guys, what would be the concentrations of the ions that make up each of those things? Each of those individual ions, so sodium and sulfate for the first guy, and potassium and chromate there for the second. So take a moment and see what, what you come up with. I erase my scribble here. There we go. So once again, two separate questions. What is concentration of the ions in each of those? Look, so remember, uh, really, when you're trying to relate for an ionic compound there, that's a solution. Um, what the molarity of the individual ions are. You want to think about how it will break apart in the solution. And in the solution, it will break apart in this case for a couple of sodiums and you'll get one sulfate that's basically floating around in that solution. So if you remember kind of the quick way that you can do concentrations of individual ions from the whole thing is we just look at like stoichiometry. Um, so when we look at the whole thing here, it is a one to two relationship between that and just the sodium ions that are present. So what we want to then do is take the molarity and times it by two, and that will actually take care of the mole to mole relationship. And for the sodium ions that are floating around in that solution, it would have a concentration of 2.4 molar. And if we do the same thing for our sulfate, it is a one to one relationship as we kind of break apart. Uh, we then basically would take one times the original concentration there. And that would get us a 1.2 molar for our sulfate ions. And again, we're twice as concentrated in terms of the sodium ions because for every one of those that goes for a swim, we get twice as much of the sodium ions basically floating around. So it's twice as concentrated. It's like a two for one special in that case. Yeah. Any questions on that there? Again, the longer calculation is a stoichiometry calculation. I think we did it last time uh, where you basically use the mole to mole relationship and kind of convert out the moles of the whole thing to the moles of the ions. We could do the same thing for our second guy there, our potassium chromate. When it's in solution, we'll break apart into two potassium ions and a chromate. And applying the same sort of logic as we just did above there, it's going to be a one to two relationship for our potassium, which means for the potassium ions that are floating around in that solution, we would need to multiply the concentration by two. 
I can give us 1.5 molar there for our potassium ions. And for our chromate, it is a one-to-one -one relationship, which means we're going to take one times our concentration, and that will give us 0.75 molar for our chromate in this case. Again, any questions on how to relate the whole guy's concentration to the individual ions that are floating around? Basically, if it breaks apart into two, to multiply by two, breaks apart into three ions, multiply by three, basically multiply it by the coefficient of how many ions you get in that solution. Any questions on that? <clears throat> All right, so let's try one here. Um, how many moles of calcium and chloride ions are present in a 42 milliliter solution of uh, calcium chloride that has a molarity of 0.35 molar. Okay, so let's take a look here. Um, we're looking for the individual ions. And there's really kind of two ways you could do this. Uh, you could start with kind of getting the moles of the whole thing. Or you could also, since you want each of the individual ions, you could just figure out the molarity of each of the ions and work from there. So I'm going to start with it that way. I'm going to think about my calcium chloride solution here. And since I'm really interested in the individual ions, I'm going to think about how it's going to break apart. And that's going to give me one calcium ion and a couple of chloride ions. And since I already know the concentration of the whole thing, I can now get my relationship to each of these ions. And that would be one times our 0.35 molar which means we have 0.35 molar is our calcium concentration. It again is a one to two relationship here for our chloride, uh, which means we could take two times our 0.35 molar, and that's going to give us our concentration of our chloride ion in this case, which is 0.7, I believe molar for our chloride. So now that I have the concentration of the individual ions, I really could just do two molarity sort of calculations because now I have the molarity of the ions. I also have the volume. So I could solve for moles, which is liters times molarity. Once again, though, we do need to convert our volume into liters. We do not want to use it as milliliters here. Uh, so that's going to be uh, 42 milliliters. There's a thousand milliliters in a liter, and that's gonna give us 0 0.0420 liters. So now we're ready to do it, say for our calcium, and that would be 0 0.0420 liters. Once again, I'm going to get rid of the big M and turn that into moles per liter of calcium. So in that case, I do want the moles up on top and liters on the bottom so that they cancel. And that will get us uh, 0.35 times 0 0.042. 0 0.0147 moles of calcium floating around in that solution. And if we do the same calculation now for our chloride, we'll take our volume because it's in the same beaker. Also gonna get rid of my big M here and turn that into 0 0.7, 0 0.700 moles of chloride per liter. And here liters will go on the bottom, 0 0.7 moles of chloride up on top. Liters will cancel 0 0.0420 times 0.7 going to give us 0 0.0294 moles of chloride basically floating around in there. Basically, again, as you can see from this calculation, twice as much chloride, right, floating around as there is moles of calcium because it's a one to two relationship when it goes into the solution. Question on that. <clears throat> the alternative approach to this, again, would be uh, you could have just got the moles of the whole thing, the calcium chloride, by multiplying the 0 0.042 times the molarity, the 0 0.35.
And at that point, done like a multiple relationship stoichiometry sort of calculation to get to the individual ions, you'll come up with the same answer at the end. Any questions on concentration of ions? <clears throat> Okay, so uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is dilution. So as we talked about uh, the other day, very commonly we are given solutions or get solutions that are really, really concentrated. Uh, they're sometimes referred to as stock solutions. They have a high molarity, for example. And a lot of times in lab and things like that, we don't really want to use a really concentrated version of it. So we do a dilution. And when we do a dilution, pretty much the only thing that's added is more solvent and in a lot of cases that's more water uh, remember water doesn't always have to be the solvent but very commonly it is uh, and when we add more water to it we will lower its concentration and what happens is the moles of the solute before the dilution and the moles of the solute after the dilution are going to be the same so why does the molarity go down if we think about what molarity is uh, molarity is moles of solute divided by liters of solution. And once again, the solution is the solute and the solvent. So in a dilution process, when you add more water or you add more solvent, uh, you're basically only adding right there, which is the bottom number. So as you add more solvent, the bottom number gets larger which means the molarity goes down, right? Because the molarity gets smaller. So the molarity decreases because you're really adding more to the solution part of it and more solvent, which will lower the molarity uh, down. The solute in both of those cases aren't touched. So however much solute you have floating around in that solution is the same amount you started with even after you dilute it. And it is, by the way, the solute in a solution that is what reacts. So if you have any type of reaction that's going to happen, it's the solute stuff that's floating around in that solution that's going to do the reaction. Uh, you know, if you had sodium chloride floating around, it's going to either be the chloride or the sodium that might react with something, probably mostly the chloride, uh, that's going to do the actual reaction. When we do a dilution or even make a solution, uh, this is the way we do it. We have some water. We put our more concentrated solution in there. This is our volumetric flask that we saw last week. It has one line, which represents its volume. And usually if it's volumetric, that is two decimal places that you take it to. So that would be like 500 milliliters in this case. You put your more concentrated guy into some water, pop it off with some more water to the line there. And at that point, you would have your solution, uh, whatever molarity you were making. <clears throat> Now, there is a formula that is used for dilutions, and this is probably the most common one, which is M1V1 is equal to M2V2. That is molarity and volume. And this is usually before the dilution. This is usually after the dilution. Now, we talked about that you should always use the volume in liters when you are multiplying it by the molarity. This is the one formula where <clears throat> if you wanted to, you could leave it in milliliters and it will work out okay. And that is because you'll have milliliters on both sides. So the units will cancel out okay. So for example, if you wanted to leave it in milliliters and you're solving for V2, V2 would be M1, V1 divided by M2. The molarities will cancel, which means these milliliters would be the same milliliters as you would get over here. So. And this, using the dilution equation, you can leave the volume in milliliters. If you have molarity, it will work out okay. Uh, if you don't want to worry about that, you could always still convert it to liters. But if you are using molarity by itself, not in a dilution situation, you should definitely convert it to liters. Otherwise, you'll be off on in terms of your units. M1 is the more concentrated guy. M2 is the least concentrated solution. That's how much of the more concentrated solution you need. That is your final volume. Now, sometimes people will use for the dilution equation C1V1 is equal to C2V2. Here, C is just generic concentration. 
Uh, and that means that you really can use any concentration unit with this equation. For example, you could use things like percent mass to mass on both sides, as long as they're in the same units. Uh, you could use percent volume to volume on both sides. So you can really use any type of concentration unit. So sometimes books will now use C1, V1 equals C2, V2. Most people use M1, V1 equals M2, V2 because molarity is probably the most common unit of concentration. So usually you have molarity. So we can just usually use that equation. But technically speaking, it doesn't have to be molarity as the unit of concentration. It could really be uh, any unit that you want. Now, very commonly, what you're asked is, you know, how much water you need to add and usually, or how much solvent you need to add to do the dilution. And usually to figure that out, um, it is the final volume minus the initial volume. So very common on dilution type questions. That's a, a question that's often sort of posed to you is like, you know, how much water do you need to add to get this thing to have a lower concentration? So usually V2 is your final volume. V1 is how much of that more concentrated guy you added. And if you subtract the two, that usually will give you the volume of the solvent that you need. Any questions on that there? All right, we'll lay it up there. For